All right, there we go. Um, the, all right, so let me take you back to where we were yesterday. Uh, yesterday we were talking, we spent quite a good deal of time talking about this age distribution. The idea was that uh, the, the experiments that we'd seen previously, the experiments that we'd seen previously were population averaged. And it's going to be uh, important, and I'll show you why in a moment, that we have some sense of what that uh, probability over which we're averaging looks like, uh, and some way, if we can, to deconvolve these, these uh, um, experimental results from this averaging over the population. Okay, and so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about that in a second. What I'm, what I'm working toward is explaining, if we can, these experiments by MOLA that were now, at the time that I'm about to talk about, a decade in the past. So these are from 1958. The experiments we'll talk about today are from 1960, 1968. And just to remind you, the idea was that uh, the faster cells grow, the faster the bacteria grow, the more mass per cell they have, that is to say the bigger they are, and the more DNA per cell they have. And that, that's puzzling, as you say. Right? And we want to resolve that puzzle. So where is that DNA coming from? And then second of all, maybe not why are they bigger, but why is this scale here one doubling per hour? And why is that a characteristic time? Okay. Well, let me pause. Any questions about last what we did last time? Okay, one, one other piece of administration. Periodically through the lectures, people have asked questions that I've deferred. <laughs> like, for example, what's the average age of a cell? I think somebody asked. So I've put papers onto that website that hopefully address those questions. And so there's a paper that addresses a question, what if we don't have a delta distributed doubling time? There's a paper that addresses... Do cells age? Do bacteria age? Uh, and there was another question that is, can we experimentally ascertain what distribution we should give for the doubling time? That's also on the page. Uh, if you have any other questions, oh, you know, ask me as we go or ask me after the lectures, and I'll, and I'll post relevant literature if you want to go deeper or farther. It's OK? All right, so then maybe I'll pause here. Any? Yeah. Could, could you say one more time? Is there any other definition for the age in bacteria, like not the, not the dividing time? Ah, no. Uh, and that's because they're immortal. So the question is, is there another way to define age? And there could be, right? There could be, uh, uh, what would you call it? This would be the age relative to the bacteria. And then there could be age relative to the laboratory, like these are four days old or something like that. But because these are in balanced exponential growth, they're sort of outside of time. The only time that matters is their time between birth and division, if that makes sense. And so this comes back to a question you asked, I think, you know, two lectures ago, which is, do the mother, or is there any noticeable difference between, the, say, the great-grandmother and the progeny of these cells? And for E. coli, none that we can tell. They're, they're, they're immortal. It's strange. I mean, from our point of view, it's humans. Yeah, yeah. Is, is the chemical uh, material in the uh, materials in the cells somehow similar to the first one? I mean, uh, yeah. can you understand that this is a generation of that um, first cell, or it's like? No. I, so, can you trace back? Can you say, if I gave you this cell and this cell, could you tell me which one was the grandmother? No. They're totally, they're totally uh, the same. It just happens that in the laboratory time, one came before the other. But so chemically, they identical. Oh, we have to be careful, though. This is our laboratory time. So this is, say, the, lab, the experiment would only take maybe six hours. So there's no evolution or anything working on these. They're, they're genetically identical. To, to, you know, to the zeroth order approximation. And so that, that allows you to say, I, I mean, that's what I'm using to tell you that they're indistinguishable. If you let these guys evolve for hundreds of years or something like that, then you can tell just from the genetic drift, you could order them in terms of their genealogy, if that makes sense. So there, there we're breaking outside of species rather than just looking at progeny 
grandmother, mother, daughter. I don't know if I, was that, yeah? Good. Any other questions? All right. So what I want to talk about today is, and like I say, uh, basically DNA replication. So it's not obvious that that's all tied together, but that's where we're headed. Uh, and the, what I really like about this experiment is that it's, again, it's very much like a mathematical proof. You have tiny steps that at each point take a little bit of thinking, but don't break your brain. But then at the end, you end up with something that's absolutely incredible. It's like a proof by Archimedes or something, um, except it's an experiment. And you say, how in the devil did he ever think this up? But this is Helmstetter, and then Cooper as well. Uh, although Helmstetter is the originator of the uh, experiment that I'm about to talk about. This is Helmstetter, 1968, and Cooper as well. Who was his, his uh, co-pilot. All right, and so the idea is uh, if, if we could synchronize these cells... then what would we do? We would take this uh, age distribution, which is this, this uh, sort of exponential, if you like, distributed across the, the possible ages of our bacteria. And again, there's more new, there are new, more, more newborns than there are uh, cells about to divide. And if we were going to synchronize, we would somehow chemically or biologically force this distribution to narrow. So we would turn this into some you know, some delta distribution. It turns out for bacteria, that's, that's seemingly impossible. <laughs> All right? But the next best thing, this is very difficult. Let's, let's not say impossible. No one has ever done it before. The next best thing to sample a narrow strip And so instead of making a delta distribution, you just take a very tiny piece of the distribution. So something like this. And then you know that all the, the cells in that strip have the same age. Okay, so you don't sample them in age, you sample them in time, if you like. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think on paper that would that would work, right? And for eukaryotic cells, it's much easier because they have checkpoints. Yeah, yeah, and so, yeah. but these guys are everything simultaneous, and so you would have to have some kind of very uh, accurate killing mechanism that's cued to something that that's not a checkpoint. I mean, it would be something. Well, I mean, you could, but that's a little bit sloppier. But you would have to cue it to say, kill the cells at some certain point of replication of DNA or something. Or no, allow those to survive. So the, we're going to do something similar here. What's going to happen is we're going to hold back all the ones that are not at a particular age and let go ones that are. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So we have no, we have no an anal analogous cycling in the system. Yeah. OK. And the reason that, that Helmstetter wanted to uh, sample narrow age distributions is because they didn't understand how DNA replicated. Okay, so I, I'll, I, I'll, I'll tell you what they knew at the time. So Helmstetter's, Helmstetter's uh, uh, what would you say, goal was to understand DNA replication. Okay, and what, what was known at the time, I've sort of uh, moved myself out of board space, but I'll, I'll do it here. 
So what was known at the time was that when these chromosomes, right, so they knew that the E. coli had a circular chromosome, and then when it replicated, there was only a single point of replication. So a single origin of replication. And so it starts, it's like a zipper, if you like. So it starts replicating at this, at this uh, closing point of the zipper, then it unzips like this, and then you have two pieces, and then the cell divides. Is that clear? Okay. I said that. All right, I mean, you don't have to tell me, but tell me why it's not clear. Okay, then I, you do have to tell me. Yeah. What? Okay, so this is the DNA molecule that contains all the genetic information. Yeah, and it's, it looks like, um, yeah, it's a circle, but say, imagine a ribbon. Is that okay? A ribbon? And so you've got a, a circular ribbon, and now you cut it at one point, and then you tear it into two circles. Is that an okay image? Do you have the image that I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. So what happens here is, so let me first tell you why I contrast this with, with another model. So here, what I'm thinking of is a single tear, and then you pull the whole thing apart. Contrast that with perforating it at, say, 50 different places, and then just pulling it apart. So there's only a single point of, of replication. And what happens is that some machinery crawls along, so this is indicated by these triangles, crawls along the... Um, crawls along this tear point, so this is called a replication fork. And it makes new DNA here. So it pulls it apart, it's a double-stranded molecule, pulls it apart into single strands, and then stitches on new DNA. So it replicates it. And then as it goes down, this is the old DNA, and this is the new DNA. Does that make sense? So this is, this is one double strand becomes two double strands. They're, they're, in principle, they're perfectly replicated. I mean, it's, it's true that occasionally errors in replication occur, and those are what we call mutations. Okay, is this, is this, uh, is this okay? So this is a, this Y is a blow up of this triangle area. And so what you have is two forks of replication that are coming down the, uh, the, the ring of DNA. And in the end, so you'll go from one ring to boop, two rings, like this. So these are the forks. These are the uh, final you know, replicated chromosomes. Is that sensible? All right, because it, logically, it's going to start to get jumbled in a second. I mean, not too jumbled, I hope. So this was known. And then, and so, so all right, so far, so good. Then Moeller postulated that the speed that these replication forks proceed at is constant, irrespective of growth rate. He had no evidence for that, really, but it's a, uh, it's the simplest possible assumption, and Moeller always went for that. So Moeller, Moeller uh, proposed, let's say, the speed of DNA replication 
was uh, growth rate independent. All right, and, and to a good approximation, it is. Um, so let's say that the time it takes to go from initiation of this replication event to separation of the sister chromosomes. So call the time it takes to replicate. So you start here. A second later or an instant later, you have this system. Then a little bit later, boom, 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 boom you have something that looks more like that. I mean, this should be coming out toward you. I'm just not a very good drawer. And then it will be more like this. <coughs> and then finally, you'll have two. So fork keeps coming down. And then it pop, they, they separate. So call this time tau cycle. That's a cell cycle time, if you like. And that's the time it takes not only to terminate this replication process, but to separate the chromosomes and then to divide the cell. Is that sensible now? So this, the table's set now. OK, so two questions. One is, if your doubling time is much, much longer than this tau cycle, so suppose this is, I don't know, 60 minutes, but your doubling time is 90 minutes, and that speed is constant, then what's, what would be one of the predictions? No, no, keep going. Okay, or unless you don't want to. Uh, yeah, I was thinking that in the, in the first lecture or the second, I, yep. I was uh, not, I was astonished that some cells have uh, more DNA per cell than another, and this depends on the, the new. So now it seems, okay, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, so, so, so I'm going to paraphrase what she said, but I'm, it, it's not exactly what you did. But if this thing took, say, 60 minutes, and you're doubling every, si every 90 minutes, then you and you replicated one and a half times per life, then y we can't possibly have a balanced state of growth. Because the first time that you grew, you would have, have 1.5 times your chromosomes. Then again, you would have 1.5 times 1.5 number of chromosomes. Then 1.5 times 1.5 times, 1 and so on. But you'd have a number greater than 1 raised to the power n, which is your generation you would just explode with DNA eventually. So how logically would you have balanced growth if this thing was, say, 60 minutes and you were doubling at 90 minutes? Right? So you would just stop. You would have a gap of 30 minutes where nothing happens. Then, boom, it starts. You have 60 minutes of replication. Then you have division. Does that make sense? So if the doubling time tau is greater than tau, cycle, there should be a gap in DNA replication. But there should be a period where there's no DNA replication. Does that make sense? So there'd be a period where nothing's happening in the cell for, say, 30 minutes. Otherwise, you would have too much DNA, and it would keep multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. Let me pause. That's important. Does that make sense? All right. Two questions, then. One is, how, yeah? Can this gap be considered as a maturing time for the cell? 
Uh, say one more time. You, you could think of it that way. You could think of it as a maturation time. So something's got to happen until it decides to replicate its chromosome. What that cue is, you know, is, is debatable. But you're right. You could think of it as a maturation. Okay, two questions. One would be, how would you ever see this gap? Because if you had a population measurement, there's so many, I mean, if you're averaging over the whole population, that gap's going to disappear. You've got it only occurring in, say, young cells. Well, fine, but you have the old cells where there is DNA replication, and they wash that out. So the only way that you could see this gap is by somehow isolating cells at different stages of their growth. I mean, there might be another way to do it, but that's what Helmstetter was thinking. Does that make sense? So his motivation is to, in some sense, validate Mola's proposal, but then I think even more importantly, ask what would happen if your doubling time was smaller than this cycle time. If it takes 60 minutes to double this thing, and you're growing at 20 minutes, what the devil's going on? It's crazy. All right, so that's what we're going to do today. Does everybody see the problem? OK. OK. Then, um, then you, let's say, you target something like um, the, the DNA, um, the enzymes that replicate the Sure. Sure. So, so that means that anyone who has it not completed the thing would not be able to do it first. Yeah. If I do that, if, if, the, if the initial distribution is uniform, then I would have like uh, a fraction which would not divide, which would be equivalent to the ones that yeah, that's a good way. So his suggestion is kill anything that has one of these triangles and then count how many survived. And you could do that. So if you could find something that specifically killed something with a replication triangle, then you'd be done. All right? How about if, if tau is less than tau cycle, then, then we're in trouble, right? And then everybody's going to try. All right. So Helmstetter wanted to uh, validate this picture and then probe the case where tau is less than tau cycle. How did he do it? And so, as I said, he, he wanted to sample a uh, narrow distribution from the age distribution. So Helmstetter, uh, and this took a, a 10 years. What I'm going to show you seems like, yeah, OK, in hindsight, obviously. But so do a lot of Archimedes proofs. <laughs> so it's got that same quality. So Helmstetter hit upon a uh, very simple, you know, in retrospect, simple way to sample from the age distribution. So what he did was he, he took a funnel, like this, and he had a filter paper here. And he poured his bacteria through the filter. So he took a test tube full of bacteria, and he dumped it in. So poor bacteria. through the filter. And then he flipped it over. Flip over. And you end up with, so again, the uh, same filter paper. Uh, the funnel's going up now, though, like this. And then he ran media through the back end of the filter. So now, this is a poor, poor drawing here. Now, fresh media. Starts dumping through like this. And as luck would have it, some of the bacteria would stick to the filter paper. 
So you'd end up with some, uh, let's see, this guy's halfway done. Um, this one just had a baby. So you had some cells stick to the filter. That's these guys. These are called the mother cells. And as they grow, so their heads are stuck to the filter, as they grow, their daughters drop off their feet. And so as they divide, their daughters or babies are washed away. But the babies who fall off all have the same age. They're freshly newborn. Okay, does that make sense? And this came from a dream that he had of chickens on the roof dropping eggs on his head. It's brilliant. And so this came to be called the baby machine. It's super cheap. It's super easy. <laughs> and you'll see in a second that it, it uh, cracks this question wide open in a way that was impossible beforehand. OK, but let me pause. Someone had a question? Yeah. What made the, the geometry like, say, they are stick there and the filter, yeah. but they should divide from vertical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if they divide in this way, yeah. the other cell will also stick to the filter. Yeah. Yeah, you'll see that, so she, her suggestion is that this is highly idealized. Not all of them are going to be stuck at the poles, and that's absolutely true. Some of them will be stuck sideways. Some of them may eventually fall off, although that, that's quite rare. But the sideways one, you'll see that they, quite a few of them do stick sideways so that their progeny remains fixed to the, uh, to the funnel. But that, you'll see where that comes in. But try to, well, actually, let me tell you what this looks like, and then imagine what's going to happen. Okay. Is the experiment okay? Do you guys see what's happening? And so what happens is, I mean, mathematically what happens, or even with a graph, what happens? Is it with the mothers? So when they get stuck to the... Um, when they get stuck to the filter, they have this, it's just, you know, a billion cells that follow this distribution. So this is, in some sense, the number distribution of ages in the cells that get stuck to the filter paper. And so then as time goes on, so here's tau, here's two tau, here's three tau. This is the babies. Baby cells. And I'm going to call this uh, flow the effluent. So it's the sort of the waste media, if you like. <clears throat> so what's happening? These guys fall off first. So let's call this T1. Then later on, the babies from these cells fall off. Does that make sense? So you've got them all stuck. The ones that are very big and about to have a baby, doop, drop their baby right away. The ones that are newborn, they have to grow, and then they drop their baby. And so what's that distribution going to look like? So again, remember that this was a probability distribution. Now I'm multiplying it by the number of mothers that get stuck to my filter. So now it's a number distribution. What's a number distribution going to look like here? It's probably easiest if we think of zero to tau first. Like this. So one possibility is it looks like this. What do you think? Say one more time. The mother eight cells. 
No, 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 exactly right. So you also have to assume that the sticking probability is uniform across the population. And, and to a good approximation, it is. So there's no bias. This guy, yeah? Oh, and so then what will you get? <laughs> Who falls off first is maybe the best question. It's a mirror image. So it's going to look like this. So where this is, if I say, you know, relative concentration, say, where I don't have to worry about normalization, this would be two, this would be one, and then, boop, 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 and then this would go up, and then and this guy would go up. And because these guys are the T1 cells, and these guys are the T2 cells. Does that make sense? So in the babies, it's like time is reversed. That's small step, but sort of, uh, you know, disorienting step number one. Okay, so in the babies, uh, age is reversed. I don't know if that's the best way to say it, but hopefully you see what I'm saying. That the ones to fall off first are coming from the oldest cells stuck to the filter paper. Yeah. Why does it start from one? Because in the time zero, we don't have any basis. Oh, yeah. Um, so this is after, there is there is a transient. You're right. So this is, say, um, you know, wait for the transient, wait for the first division, then start. You're right. I mean, it'll go like this. Is that okay? <laughs> so ignore the transient. Does that make sense? What I want to, to uh, orient you to is this, is this uh, inversion. Yeah. So, so, um, do you mean why is it decreasing? Here? No, the, the second yeah, steps. They should yep. all start from the I mean it should be completely Oh 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 should go. Yeah. yeah? What do you think? So two things here. One is that it's flipped in time. Is that okay? Now, why is it not uh, an escalator? So it's. Oh, the number of number of cells that are stuck to the bottom is the same. Exactly. So exactly where you guys. So this is probably the image to keep in mind. Once this event happens, that age resets itself. Basically, it grows, dumps its baby, but the baby has left the system, left the the filter paper. So it's as it was a generation ago. Ideally, but your your previous question is going to come back. Uh, okay, so is everybody, so first of all, the time is okay, I, I think, but now how about the drops, drop, drop, is that okay? Yeah. Exactly, exactly, that's the problem. If they were synchronized, we wouldn't need to go through all this because we would just have, we would have, we would have zero peak, zero peak, zero peak. This dropping? It's because, it's because once the baby is born, she's washed away, and only one of the mothers remains. And so it's, it's as though you reset again. So this is this point here is where the newborn cells have their babies, 
And there are going to be more of them because there were more newborn cells to begin with stuck to the filter. But now suddenly, it's a periodic boundary condition. You end up now looking at the, the uh, oldest cells who are now ready again to, to have babies again. So you keep moving through this distribution backward in time with a periodicity. Does that make sense? And the reason it's not cumulative is because the babies don't stick to the filter. If the baby's stuck to the filter, well, this, this wouldn't make sense. It would just be zero. And you would end up with that in the, yeah? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's look. Yeah? You would, right? But it, what turns out is that you have more what she suggested, which is that the babies stick. And so here's the picture that I have, or this is the data. So ignore the kind of transients. Who was worried about transients? So ignore these transients. But this periodicity comes from the cell division cycles. This slow upward creep comes from babies getting stuck to the filter. And so there are, there are you know, many non-idealized uh, factors here, but the overall sort of doop doop doops is what they're after. Yeah, but once the babies get stuck, start getting stuck, yeah. unless you know what are the chances of babies getting stuck, you can't really, you can't really sample it. Yeah, so, so this, this thing is kind of going up like this. What's, what's also brilliant about this experiment is it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> that these things are going up, that there's some slowly creeping offset, doesn't matter, because what he's going to be measuring is uh, delta changes in a, a secondary quantity that I'll talk about in a second. But, uh, but I, just want, I, I just want conceptually people to see that this, this oscillation comes from that babies getting born. The slow creep up comes from what she was suggesting, which is that babies get, you know, don't, in an ideal world, you would have just a flat baseline. But you have inevitable creep. So in some sense, it's actually beneficial because you actually have more things falling once you let more babies stay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
So, so he, you know, holds the spigot open for a minute and samples us. All right, so this, this is not yet the experiment. I mean, this is the setup. This is the baby machine. This is the narrow um, sort of ticking out of the population. But we haven't yet said why this has anything to do with DNA replication. And as it stands, it does not. So, but, but we'll get to that in one moment. All right. But I want this to be clear, because otherwise it just it starts to get foggier and foggier, and then it's just incomprehensible. <laughs> but is this OK? And I promise you, if it's not clear right now, it'll just take two minutes to clear up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, only only for this, the only sort of uh, this this drop here is more or less a transient as as things. So you've got a big puddle of cells at the beginning. You dump them and they wash out, and then you have to let the system equilibrate a bit. And so you, it sort of takes a little bit of bouncing around. Yeah. Is that I don't know if I answered. Yeah. If I had Yeah. I would start at a bigger value than what I experimentally measure, and then the experiment would go upper than my theoretical prediction as I go in generations. Yeah. Correct? Yeah, and that's because the babies are sticking to the filter, which is, which is, you know, you would want that not to be there. The other thing, too, is that these are not sharp. I mean, they should be vertical, but they, are, they have some, uh, uh, what would you call it, slope? non-infinite slope, if you like, right? And that's because the, the age distribution in practice is not delta distributed. And so you have sort of a, a curve here. All right. But again, these are all small points that mercifully don't impact the, um, the experiment that we'll talk about in a moment. But again, let me pause. Any, anyone want to clarify this? Time's flipped. Yeah? Uh, I understand the, 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 the yeah. So this, this, think of this as a relative concentration. So this might be 6 billion, and this would be 3 billion. And it would go, there would be, there are half as many about to have babies as there are who were just born. And that's because when they're born, they make two. Here. So these guys are falling off of this part. And there are there are half as many oh, so here there are twice as many here as there are here. Does that make sense? Ah, okay, all right. I should have labeled both axes. Any other questions? Okay, let's get to the weird part. Um, so the way that uh, Helmsteader wants to look at DNA synthesis is the following. So he will, he, he has his cells growing in a flask, and then he's going to dump them into this filter. But before he does that, so to, um, I should turn this off because it's not relevant. Screen, black. All right. To uh, measure DNA synthesis rate, He does something that's called pulse labeling. So he grows his cells for uh, one minute in radioactive uh, phimidine. So I'll, I'll write it up. And this is one of the DNA bases. So it only appears in DNA. I mean, there's free thymidine, but not much. 
It doesn't appear in RNA, it doesn't appear in proteins. This is a chemical that's specific to DNA. And you can get it, you know, in the world, it's just regular, it's just made up with carbon-13, but he's gonna get specially made carbon-14 thymidine. <laughs> and so then he, for one minute, lets these cells grow, and then he flips them and pours them through the filter paper. Okay, then flips or pours them, then, you know, pours them through the filter. And then he measures the radioactivity in the cells that come out. So the, the new media that he pours through has no radioactivity. The media that he grew them in before had no radioactivity. And so what he's trying to measure is the number of forks, basically. Because the amount of radioactivity that a cell takes on in this one minute is proportional to the number of forks, replication forks that it has going on. Okay, so his idea is the following, and then let's talk about it. So his idea is the uh, level of radioactivity in a cell is proportional to the number of forks, the number of replication forks. Okay, so you, you have them uh, exposed to this radioactivity for one minute. If it has two forks, then it takes in twice as, well, two is, okay. So if it t has two forks, it takes in a certain amount of radioactivity. If it happened to have four forks, for example, it would take in twice as much radioactivity, if that makes sense. Or if it had no forks, it would take in no radioactivity, and then suddenly when it had two forks, it would take twice as much radioactivity in, if that makes sense. Does everybody see what I'm saying? So by reading the, the radioactivity in the baby cells, then he should get some sense for the number of forks that were going on at that age in the parents. It's like three levels of inference, but hopefully they're okay. Yeah? Oh, you just, uh, you just put it into the media? So you grow them in, in a regular media. Uh, probably there would have been, I wonder if he supplied the thymidine. He probably does. So what he would do is grow them cells that can't make their own thymidine. He would supply it in a medium non-radioactive. So they're bringing it in and incorporating it. And then he would add radioactive thymidine in huge excess, like say 500 times more than was in the media to begin with. Then you're guaranteed that the thymidine that you're taking in is radioactive. You've like less than 1% of a chance to take in a non-radioactive thymidine. Does that make sense? You, you have to make sure they can't produce their own thymidine, otherwise you have to label all the carbon sources. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is it lethal? Oh, 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 I see. So this... So this, is a, this was, uh, although less so now because of safety regulations all over the place, but it still remains a fairly standard procedure in biology, is if you want to label something, and now we do it with fluorescent po proteins primarily, but labeling with radioactivity is, is a well-established practice. It turns out that radioactivity, I mean, is usually non-hazardous <laughs> to us and to the bacterium. Is that what you mean? Is that what you're worried about? Or, or that the, chemical, the chemicals are distinct enough that the cell can treat, will treat them differently? No, I was just thinking about the radioactive mutation. Ah, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So, so they, don't, they don't seem to incur mutations. Okay, they're not high enough energy radiation to, to worry too much about that. Any other questions? Okay, so his idea is this. Suppose you have the mothers. So now we're going to talk about the mothers. 
And then in a moment, we're going to talk about their daughters. So here are the mother cells. Here are their ages. Suppose something like this happens. So this is now uh, radioactive radioactivity per cell. Suppose something like this. Happens. What, what would you, what would you suppose was going on? And so this is now relative radioactivity. So it was one, and it jumps to two. What will be your interpretation? The first part is representing the gap. It could be, yeah. Okay. If the, even easier, even easier would be the gap one. So suppose the gap goes like this. Now it's not. Now it's going to be an absolute units. But how would you how would you interpret that? What what does it what does a change represent? Division Pardon me. Division so division happens at the end here. Right. So this is. This age at which you see a jump corresponds to, so a jump, let me write it out and let's talk about it. A jump in the uh, relative um, radioactivity per cell, per cell corresponds to the initiation, initiation of DNA replication. All of a sudden on the scene appears two replication forks that can pull in radioactivity that weren't there before. And this line that I've drawn then is what, what I mean, I think could be reasonably denoted uh, the age of initiation or initiation age. Now let's say age of initiation. And so for cells that are growing much, much longer than the, the cycle time that it takes to replicate the DNA, that age of initiation would make up the gap. And it turns out that it's actually like this. It's, it's a gap at the beginning of the cell, cell's lifetime, and then DNA starts to replicate and then terminates its cell, cell division. Is that, does everybody see the logic? Yeah. No, OK. Tell, so which? Okay, so I have in mind the case where the cell is not replicating its DNA. So this is this is a cell doubling, say, every 100 minutes. And yeah, but it doesn't suck in this radioactive thymidine if it's not replicating DNA. That's the key. That's the brilliant part of this. It's only going to take in this radioactivity if it's replicating DNA. It's a logical, it's a logically compelling argument. I mean, it has to be clear, otherwise then it's not compelling. But is it clear? So this means that the cell is living for some time before that starts to replicate. Exactly. So this would be the case if this replication time was much, much longer than the time it takes to replicate DNA. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. Yep, exactly. Okay. All right. And so, so what, uh, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Sorry. <laughs> this is what I wanted to do. Okay. So he, I'm going to tell you about the experiment he did 
1968. In 1967, he looked at slow-growing cells, saw this gap, and he was very pleased, very excited. Because th the benefit of this uh, experimental setup, in addition to being cheap and super easy, is that you don't touch the cells after they've been uh, labeled. You label them when they're growing exponentially in a flask, so you're no more sort of um, prone to people shouting at your experiments because they're artifacts than anybody else who is doing radioactive labeling. And everybody's doing it, so nobody's going to get mad about that part. Then you dump it through his filter paper. You've, you haven't touched it. It's still growing exponentially in balanced growth. But it's a minimal perturbation. It's no surprise that Helmstetter spent a lot of time in Mola's lab. So they're, they're very sympathetic in their approach to these systems. Right? And Helmstetter was trying to find a way to do this without perturbing the cell, without your observation disturbing the, the information that you get out of it. Okay, so 67, I won't show you the data because it, it might be tricky. It's, it's better if I show you the new data from 1968. So this is now, Helmstetter is growing cells that are much more rapidly growing. So they have doubling times of say 30 minutes, 40 minutes. And he's joined by Cooper, and together they look at this data. And what he sees is, so this is radioactivity in the mother. All right, and so in the baby cell, so this is now radioactivity. Um, and I'm going to put uh, I'm going to put this on a log base two scale, log base two of the radioactivity per baby cell in the effluent. Okay, and it's going to look like this. So here is two. Here is you know one. Here is 0 0.5. Here is now 0 0.25. Okay, so these are equally spaced because I'm on a log base two. And I want to show you what, what he sees. So he will see, uh, uh, oh, uh, oh. <laughs> what's going to happen here? Uh, zoop, zoop, zoo. And then he'll see, mm, mm. So here's this thing. Uh, this thing will go up, up, up. And this thing, okay. I'll get out of the way in one second. I just want to do that. Okay, he saw this. <laughs> so, and so then the, the uh, um, interpretation is that you have something that goes like this in the mother. Okay, so we won't yet talk about why this thing looks so weird. We will, however, talk about what, what he measured. So then he measured this. So he said, the first time that you see a rise in the DNA replication rate corresponds to the triggering or initiation of a, a fork of replication. Does that make sense? I mean, not the bottom plot. So he used the bottom plot to infer the upper plot, and then he measured this time, this age. But that is only the, they start, they start measuring their equal to zero, coincides with the time when the mother was born. Yeah. Yes. So that is only the start. Yes. How do you mean? Wait, sorry. Here? Here. Yeah. What if, what if the D equal to zero was not D equal to zero for the, for the mother? No, this is, this is the age. This is, uh, so, so there might be some transient here, but you set zero to be the point where you had the first division. So absolute time now falls out of the equation. You, you're talking about here. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, th these are the same points.
Uh, yeah, but you're only, yeah, so the mothers are unsynchronized. So, okay, so you have, you have this situation. for the number of mothers. Is that all right? Yeah? This might solidify the discussion. Is that okay? Yeah? And then you, you throw radioactivity on them, and then you allow time to advance by one minute. And so everybody that's at this age, plus delta A, uh, takes in their amount of radioactivity. Everyone that's at this age, for one minute, takes in radioactivity. And so it's an unbiased sample of the population of what the person at that age or the mother at that age is doing in terms of their DNA replication. Oh, yeah, 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 okay, yeah, yeah. So this minute is enough for you to get hundreds of bases of DNA, and so you lose any, any that's important too. The thymidine is not biased either. Any other questions? Is that okay for you? It's okay? So it's, I mean, it's, there are like five different things happening here. <laughs> but the thing is that the, so for the one minute that he lets them be exposed to the radioactivity, they have some consumption rate. And so you integrate that, that rate along that one minute time, and that tells you how much uh, thymidine comes in. So there's an integral going on. And that integral then integrates across this amount of space. And that tells you how much thymidine comes in. But then you put on top of it this, which is telling you, so these guys consume at some low rate. These guys consume at some very high rate, and these at some moderate rate. And so if you integrate a small piece of that, you should get a little less radioactivity than if you integrate over a small piece of this. That's, that's the idea. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly, exactly. Let's go, can you just hold it in your mind for one second, and then let me show you what the plot of this looks like. Okay, and then, and then, uh, let, so let me show you the plot, and then we'll break, and you can think about what the plot means. All right, and so now if you look at the doubling time, so this is doubling time, And this is the relative age. So now this is going to be the age of initiation divided by the doubling time. So you count this, it's like five minutes for a cell growing at 30 minutes or something like this. Right? And so this will be between zero and one. And this is gonna have real units. This is something that you, you're using your watch to count. And so I'm gonna start so these E. coli, you can't really grow them any faster than, say, 20 minutes. So you have 20 minutes, uh, let's say 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. I'll give you one more, 80. All right. And so for very slow-growing cells, this is what he's observed in 1967, this age of initiation goes like that. It increases. And it increases for the reasons that was suggested earlier. There's a gap. And then it starts replicating. But then there's a, suddenly a discontinuity. 
and you have it jumping up to one and then falling down again and then jumping up to one and falling down again and if I've um, timed this correctly there we go so it's not as so my plot is idealized <laughs> but this is a data and I've left or he's left off the data from 1967 but I put it in here because I, I want you to be able to possibly solve the puzzle. So does everybody see what I'm saying? He's got these weird shapes, which we'll come back to in a second, like after the break. But more importantly, he's got these discontinuities in this age of initiation. And they look exactly like this. So boom, boom, boom. Does that make sense? So he doesn't see a spike here at all, really. But then I'd say 58 minutes, he sees a spike just before division. And then that age sort of creeps closer and closer, and then no, no spike, and then a spike uh, just before division, at about twenty, you know, for twenty-eight minute growing cells. All right, does, does the data make sense? I mean, no, 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 not the interpretation, but does the actual plot itself, do the do the axes make sense to what he's measuring? And again, it doesn't really matter that the the data itself was creeping up or anything like that, because he's measuring jumps in, in radioactivity. And so that you can get pretty accurately, irrespective of some baseline shift, which is one of those great things. All right, let me pause. Yeah? What do I mean? Oh, get the plot. So what he's doing is he runs this type of experiment um, for, at different growth rates. He knows where the cells are dividing because he knows how the number count is going. And then he measures this gap he says, all right, going backward in time, he actually plotted them, flipped around, which is a double you know, mix-up. He measured this time, which is in absolute units, so it's say 15 minutes. So he writes that down. Then he does it at a different growth rate, he gets 10 minutes, he writes that down. And then he plots the age of initiation divided by the growth rate, and he gets some number between 0 and 1. And he does that for all these different growth rates. So this he can change by changing the nutrient that the cells are growing in. This he measures from this radioactivity jump. Is that okay? <laughs> Just where the data is coming from, not necessarily why it's jumping around like crazy. But is the data where the data is coming from okay? Pardon me? Okay, no, think about it though. Don't, you don't, don't worry. It, it, so this is a real puzzle. Okay, all right, any questions about what the data means? All right, we'll simultaneously answer like four questions right after the break. So your original question, why does the DNA increase with, cell, with growth rate, is, has been just lurking in the background for days. So we'll come to that. And your question of why, it's, why would it ever overshoot is gonna happen, we'll, we'll talk about that in like five minutes too. All right, let me pause. Oh, and what we've never talked about is why is, does it take one hour, why is one hour doubling special for that mass per cell plot? That's also going to be cleared up. All right, any questions? All right, okay, I'll see you in like, you know, five minutes, ten minutes. Which is, is how they got this data, or how they rationalized this data, but I think it's easier for us in retrospect to figure this out. So, what we now know, what we now know is that to go from here to here to here, so to fully replicate the DNA takes about 40 minutes. Now to separate, oh gosh, sorry. Apologies to the camera guys. Uh, to go from, oh heavens, double apologies. Oh. <laughs> uh. So, I, all right. Okay, I think that'll work. All right, 
So to go from initiation of DNA replication to a fully replicated chromosome, Muller was right. I mean, it's, it's mostly growth rate independent. And it takes about 40 minutes. And then the cell has to do another, I mean, it's physically, there's nothing else it can do. It needs to separate that DNA into its daughters before they divide. And so to go from, so these are now just, just completed replicated chromosomes to, you know, separated and divided, that takes about 20 minutes. Okay, so we have these two processes, and, and uh, oh, for goodness sake, what am I doing wrong? All right, okay, and so Helmstetter and Cooper called these two different names, so they called this the C time and the D time, which I mean, will be, it's just a nice shorthand. But the C plus D is going to be the cycle time. Does everybody understand what I've drawn here in terms of cartoons? No matter what you do, these forks will take 40 minutes to get from the beginning to the end. No matter what you do, it's going to take 20 minutes for these DNA strands to separate into their respective daughters before cell division. All right, so to move from initiation of replication to termination of replication takes 40 minutes. To go from termination to cell division takes 20 minutes. And there's nothing you can do about it. Now, here's the question. Why can a cell double every 20 minutes? It seems impossible. So what's the resolution? Exactly. So you parallelize this. You initiate multiple forks of replication. So. How do we divide? Do, do they divide faster than 60 minutes? And the answer is multiple forks. And so we saw this, I mean, we didn't make a big deal about it when we were talking about protein synthesis, but ribosomes, which are driving protein synthesis, work for the most part at full blast, as fast as they can. <coughs> right, so then, in order to make protein faster, the cell can't turn the rate up, it just adds more ribosomes. It parallelizes the process. It makes a production pipeline. The same thing goes here. We can't make these forks move any faster. All right, add more forks. It's, it's incredible. I mean, it's a really clever engineering strategy. All right, and so what you end up with then is something that looks like this. You have one set of forks here, and there's an origin of replication like that. And then you would have another set of forks here, and another set of forks here. Oops, what have I done? <laughs> what am I doing? Good heavens. Uh, oh, yeah, no, that's good. Forks here, forks here. That's horrible. Let me draw a big, nice picture. Okay, so here's a fork, here's a fork, here's an origin, here's an origin. And then you initiate a second origin. Here's a fork, here's a fork, um, here's a fork, here's a fork, and there's another replication. So here we have simultaneously one plus two rounds of DNA replication. Okay, and so when you, when you have something like this, you'll have uh, one round here, one, two, three. So this would be the synthesis rate. We'll go from one. Then you initiate the second rate. You'll get one, two, three three times more synthesis rate, and then you'll drop down to two. So this is with two forks. This is with two plus two to the two forks. And now this is just two to the two forks. 
if that makes sense. So, so now you've got, you've got two forks coming down at the beginning, and then halfway through, well, you know, whatever, a third of the way through the generation, you initiate these new replication sites. So you have these old forks plus these new forks. A boink. And then you keep going, and this fork, these two forks meet at the bottom and terminate. But boink. But you don't fall back to your new, to your old rate because you still have these two simultaneous forks proceeding. And so what, what, uh, what uh, Helmstead was measuring was this first age. And so each time we get a discontinuity, that's initiation of a new, uh, or that's pushing initiation of DNA replication back another generation. So I'm going to unpack this a little bit more, and then we'll break for lunch. But what's going on here is that the bacteria themselves are self-initiating. So I wait, I wait, I initiate replication, and then I divide, and it's all me. But here, your mother is initiating replication for you, or better not anthropomorphize it, the mother is initiating DNA replication for their daughter. And so the daughter is born with a half-replicated chromosome. And that's how they're able to double much faster. And here, the grandmother is initiating the chromosome. The mother keeps growing the chromosome, and it passes it on to the daughter, almost fully replicated. It's extraordinary. Does that make sense? I mean, it doesn't need to make sense, but just in, in general. And then we'll look at it quantitatively in a, in, yeah, we'll sketch it quantitatively today, but then we'll go into it in more detail tomorrow. But now, so that's why the DNA is increasing. It's not that it's a different species, it's that you're carrying redundant information for your daughter later on. But this leads then to a point that notice that the DNA that's close to the origin is effectively amplified by replication. And the cell can take advantage of that. We'll talk more about that maybe on uh, tomorrow. But does everybody understand this parallelization? It's extraordinary. I tell you there's a speed limit? No, there's not. You, just add, you know, you add more cars to the road, basically. Yeah? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so, and so if, you, if you look back, so I think it's probably going to be easiest to sketch it the way Helmstetter did, which is graphically. I mean, that's the way that I gravitate to, but then that sometimes doesn't work. And then we'll do it analytically with pencil and paper. But you're exactly right. So the, as you go past these discontinuities, you're moving from self-initiation, mother initiates, grandmother initiates. And if you could grow faster, your great-grandmother would initiate and so on. And you'd have these hugely branched uh, DNA loops. All right, any other questions? And so what we have then, I mean, this isn't how Helmstetter described it, although it is graphically how he uh, derived his rules, is a tiling of a continuum of division times. So these are dividing whatever they might be dividing, say, for every 45 minutes. And that's, that's what I do by fixing the chemical composition of their test tubes. And I can change that any way I like. But lurking underneath that is a discrete tiling of that continuum in chunks of 40 and 20 minutes. Thump, 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 thump. And the cell, of course, has to figure out how to do that, and it does it, but that's regulation. What we're talking about here is phenomenology. Given that the regulation is there, what can we predict, for example, about the age of initiation? Okay, and so Helmstead went the other way. He looked at this data and inferred this. Well, he and Cooper, which is an extraordinary act of mental agility, I think. But I'll show you how he did it tomorrow, I guess. I'll show you tomorrow how he did it. And if you feel like it, you know, you can just read the end of this lecture. And as I say, he just literally drew tiles. So one tile that was the division time. All right, I'll sketch it. It'll just take one minute, and then we'll break for lunch. So Helmstetter's is tile uh, the generations
with um, strips of uh, 40 minutes or C minutes and D minutes. And so, for example, he would have, let me see what his picture looked like. And again, I'll just start this. So he used squiggly line for tau equals, say, 35 minutes. And this works much better if you've got um, a piece of graph paper to do this on. So I'm going to freehand it, and it's not going to be to scale. But the next line would be the 40 minutes. Oh, it's not bad, but. And then a dash line that was half as long again, which is D equals 20. And then he moved this over and repeated the tiling. And so he would have this, and then this, and then this, and then again. So, and this is again, this will be the last thing I, I draw, and then we'll break for lunch. Now, did I do that okay? Yeah, and you would keep going until, depending on how fast these cells are growing. Does everybody see what I'm doing? I've got a strip, and then I just keep displacing it. Ideally, of course, you would have these squiggly lines as you're in the background, and then you would lay transparent pieces of C and D on top of them, and then just look at the the darkness or something, or the transparency. But here he's separating them. And then if you look from here to here, you have a complete record of what's going on inside the cell during one division period. And so what you have is DNA replication up to here. So now if you look at the forks per cell, you would have, say, um, one fork, or one pair of forks. Then here you would get, so this is now two forks, say. This would jump. This would be two plus two squared forks. Because each one of these initiates a new round. Uh oh, this one terminates, but these guys are still around. So you get you know, two, two forks till the end here. What did I do? <laughs> what have I done? Sorry, this ending should be here. There we go. Yeah. So from this point to this point is one cell division. These solid lines tell you the history of the DNA replication. Two forks. Then each of these forks initiates a fork. This one terminates but leaves its progeny forks. And so in this way, he was able to rationalize those very strange DNA replication graphs. <laughs> I mean, this is graphical. And to try and extract an analytic expression for these ages of initiation uh, doesn't look like it's going to be easy, but it will be pretty straightforward. But I think it's best if we let it stew, and then we'll talk about it tomorrow, if that's OK. But let me pause, though, just if there are any clarification questions, and then we can really resolve this tomorrow. Any questions? Yeah. Sorry, I have a question about the same graph. How could it uh data about the number of multiple forms uh depends on the media that you choose? Because I guess that sixty five does more energy than the uh eighty five forms than only one or two. Yeah. Okay, and so her question is what about the media so irrespective of the composition of your growth medium, if you're doubling at one, doubling every 35 minutes, it will look exactly the same, no matter what the recipe is. And so that's one of the great findings of MOLA, and it continues here. So, but we'll talk about that tomorrow. Any other questions? Is it? Oh, no, there's randomness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the question is, is this true at the single cell level? Of course, expected distribution at the single cell level for all of these parameters, all right? And that's stuff that people are measuring these days, but are impossible at this time. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, great. So let's have lunch, and I'll see you guys tomorrow.